Today we have distinguished professor of physics from UCSD, the uh, chancellor's professor, uh, Brian Keating, who is uh, instrumental with the Simons Foundation and their work with uh, Telescope down in Chile. Tell us more about that, Brian. So yeah, I am the uh, <clears throat> the direct the director of what's called the Simons Observatory Project uh, Office in San Diego, which is a consortium of over 40 universities building the most ambitious telescope ever made to search for the cosmic uh, beginning, the spark that ignited the Big Bang. We, as pictured behind me, if you can see in the video, the site in the high Atacama Desert of Northern Chile at 17,200 feet above half the atmospheric pressure that we feel at sea level, we're wow. building the most ambitious observatory ever made to look back to our cosmic origins. Wow. Wow, that's super awesome. So, you know, with this knowledge, uh, you know, what, what type of scientific uh, research do you think we'll be able to do 10, 20, 30 years down the road from this? So we have an experience of Moore's law-like growth in astronomy, and it comes along with it uh, a budget that is astronomical as well. And my feeling is as long as we can keep the budget increasing with the science capabilities and technological advancements, we will be able to unlock mysteries that our ancestors, even as, as early as 40, 50 years ago, couldn't have possibly dreamed of. When we discover the composition, the age, the expansion rate of the universe, uh, it will allow us in the future to really make distinctions that were purely the realm of science fiction or even philosophy, theology, and religion just a few decades ago. Namely, did the universe have a single beginning? That's perhaps the one question that I'd most like to ask God if God exists or nature, mother nature, uh, the, the question of how did the universe come to exist and what, if anything, can be said about what happened on the Tuesday before the Big Bang? Does that question even make sense? Folks like Stephen Hawking said, that's nonsensical. You can't ask about that. Time itself came into existence. But we have really no idea if Stephen Hawking was right. And this experiment, the Simons Observatory, and our hotly competitive experiments, you know, we're not the only people that are smart, capable, and, uh, and able to build experiments like this. There's a hot bed of competition in this field to discover what happened at the beginning of time, because if successful, the team that would do it perhaps would win the most exalted prize that humanity has to offer, which is the Nobel Prize. Yes. Now let's get to that. That has been something that has, a, I hate to say, has defined your career, losing the Nobel Prize. You know, you wrote a book on it about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, and you know, it's something that has become you know a part of you. Are, are you gonna? Are you going to outgrow this, or is this going to be your obsession till death? Yeah. So the book, I um, I, I urge people to read it, not not because it's you know going to make me so wealthy uh, that I will no longer need the Nobel Prize million dollar uh, award money, but really because it's a story of a memoir of a scientist striving to do the ultimate in 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 my field. And it's applicable to any field. If you're trying to make partner in a law firm, if you're trying to get the Keeler Williams, you know, uh, re seller of the year, if you're trying to get uh, the, to be class president in your in your college, what does it mean to come That's up politics. short? Becoming that? class president is politics. So I guess the question is, how much mm -hmm. of the Nobel Prize is politics in the end? Then? There's a tremendous amount. There's a new book that, because I wrote this book, I got interested and invited to do all sorts of opportunities, one of which was to blurb, to write the blurb on the back of a book that's coming out in November by a, a woman who's become a friend. I've never met her. She lives in Norway, and she wrote a, a new book called Betraying the Nobel Prize, Betraying the Nobel, about all the evils that she perceives in the corruption of the Nobel Peace Prize where it's been awarded to warmongers, to, to women and men who are responsible for deaths and, and so forth. And we make, she makes the point, and I've made the point, that the Nobel Prize has an obligation to live up to these lofty ideals that both Alfred Nobel created it for, and also that society holds it to do. In other words, the Nobel Prize in any field is the most prestigious award that you could possibly win. It's more prestigious than the Oscars. It's more, the you know, field medal is pretty fantastic, uh, I'll say. But, <laughs> but you can only win the field medal if you're 40 and younger, and it's only given every five years or so. So, yes, it, it, is, it is extremely prestigious, but, uh, but there's all sorts of additional restrictions on the field's medal. Some say it's even worse than the Nobel Prize. You know, uh, for me, though, the 
Nobel Prize is a manifestation of the ideals of the Nordic people. I have worked with the Nordic Innovation House and done extreme amounts of research into the Nordic countries. And they have a tradition of hard work, diligence, and education that is really quite unique to those uh, countries and that area of the world. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a fantastic prize. But do you want to talk about BICEP2 and what happened there? with the dust. Yeah, so just before we move on, I mean, what you said is true, but of course it's not just, you know, a prize given away uh, to Norwegian people, although you're a lot more or to Swedish people as actually Sweden's a lot more populous than Norway's, you know, um, and the Swedish prizes are the four, five Nobel prizes um, that are given out and the peace prize is the only one that's given in Norway. But, uh, but you're right, there is a, a work ethic and integrity of that, but the Nobel prize has now come to be the thing that determines how much funding gets applied in places like Taiwan, in, in, in California, in tenure decisions that are made, and naming streets after people's names. It's no longer restricted to mere you know, Scandinavian interest. It's, it used to be, you're right. And actually, if you look at the Google uh, Ngram search and you search on uh, Pulitzer Prize versus Nobel Prize, for a long time, the Pulitzer Prize was much more prestigious than the Nobel Prize. I don't think we would say it is today. I think... If you gave a tra chance between a person winning the Nobel Prize in Literature or the Pulitzer Prize, there's not even a competition. There's movies. Right. Say again? No, I would agree. Uh, Nobel Prize is uh, far superior to the but Pulitzer Then does it not have an out, like Hollywood had its Me Too movement because in particular, Hollywood has such outsized impact on our culture. You know, Hollywood movies only make only them. I'm not going to sneeze at it, but it may make up that $99 billion a year, but they have an impact way beyond the market cap of stocks that are, are companies that are, that are worth 10 times that amount. So, um, and that's because, so they have a different obligation, which is why the Me Too movement was so important to, to really, you know, draw attention to, to corruption and problems within the Hollywood scene. And now with the book that I wrote and the book that my friend Uni Turatini has written, about the Peace Prize, you know, we're hoping that we'll use the prestige of these prizes to reform them so that they can be the beacon of hope that Alfred Nobel intended them to be. Um, so BICEP2 was an experiment that's over my shoulder here. It's at the South Pole, Antarctica, which is the most southern point in the, in the, on the planet. How much time uh, did you spend there? Uh, say again? How much time did you spend in Antarctica? I've been there twice, and you spend about a month each time, unless you want to spend 11 months of your life, you have to get out by February. Uh, because after February, it's too cold for planes to take off again. They can land, but their uh, their fluids or hydraulics will freeze up and seize up, and that will destroy these military cargo planes that get us down there. So the government doesn't allow flights in or out after February, which is the beginning of their win you know, their fall <clears throat> uh, down the southern hemisphere. We go there because it's one of the best places on Earth, next to the Chilean Atacama Desert that I showed before, to do astronomical research. You have an uninterrupted, unobstructed view into the cosmos, except perhaps by a little bit of the atmosphere that re is residual above our heads. Uh, but you might not know this, but the South Pole is at an elevation of almost 10,000 feet above sea level because of all the millennia of ice that have accumulated and brought us up in this platform of cold, dry, uh, almost snow free is uh, ironically uh, environment that allows us in a six month window where there's no sunlight whatsoever above the horizon. So it's a phenomenal place to do astronomy, which is why I designed this BICEP2 experiment with my colleagues at Caltech and elsewhere to uh, look for the birth pangs of the Big Bang and how it came to be. Hoping concomitantly with that, I personally was hoping I'd win the Nobel Prize. I make no secret of that. Uh, but now having come through a brush with it and really uh, being asked to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize soon after I was disqualified, I mean, spoiler alert, the title is losing the Nobel Prize, not winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, and because of that, I had an encounter that really caused me to reflect on why did I want to win it so much? Why was it so important to my soul as a, as a human being to win this relatively, you know, uh, abstract thing, uh, opaque a non-transparent prize that um, why does it have such a, why did it have such an influence over me and what can be done about it in the future? Well, let's talk about uh, the dust specifically and how it misled the BICEP2 team. Uh, do you want to go into that? Yeah. So the uh, search that we had was really, you know, thought to be a fool's errand in the beginning. We'd never thought we would actually detect anything. And if we did detect something, we thought, oh, well, we'll, you know, we'll take the time, we'll go back, we'll double check it, and we'll make sure that everything is, is correct and that we actually did see what we saw, we said, but we're not going to see it anyway. 
uh, because the signals that we're trying to detect, Alex, are at the parts per billion level. In other words, the South Pole is freezing, freezing cold, but even it is 10 billion times hotter, if you like, than the signal size that we were attempting to measure from a emanation from this early epoch in the universe that, that came shortly after the Big Bang, if true. And that's, uh, they, these are called gravitational waves. They ha make a certain pattern on the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I describe all that along with the memoir component of my book is really a description uh, for the first time of why this is so important to look for the signal and what it would be as a harbinger, as an imprimatur of the earliest epoch in the universe's history that would ever be accessible to humankind. And so the stakes could not be higher. And yet we thought, eh, we're never going to detect it, but let's try it anyway, because you, you miss all the shots you don't take, as Wayne Gretzky said. So in our case, we built this experiment. And we never thought we'd see something. We built a successor to it that upgraded it, added, you know, like uh, increasing the processor speed, you know, like the iPhone. Every couple of years, you got upgraded. We upgraded. It became Bicep 2. And then we made a discovery that wouldn't go away. In other words, we tried to prove ourselves wrong. We detected yeah. the very signal that we were trying to detect. And whenever that happens, you have to be very, very nervous because the, the as Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate used to say, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, you have to be very careful. And the first principle is not to fool yourself. And you're the easiest person in the world to fool. Meaning you have to look for all the ways you could be wrong as a scientist, not all the ways you could be right. So we looked at that, including what's called dust, which is really nothing more than, you know, tiny micrometeorite particles that are the relic remnants of a previous supernova that lived in our galaxy, not far away from perhaps where our solar system is. And the, uh, these dusty materials are pervasive throughout the cosmos. They're in stars or galaxies, solar systems. And, uh, and because of that, we knew we'd have to confront it, but we didn't have the data. We needed desperately to get data that was only sensitive to dust and not sensitive to the Big Bang signals we sought. We didn't have that data. A competitor experiment did have the data. And I describe in the book the agony, the anguish of like dealing with your competitor who wants to win the Nobel Prize as much or more than you. They spent a billion euros on their project called the Planck Satellite. We only had $10 million, <clears throat> but you know, we're competing kind of That's David. That's the Boston Planck Institute? No, this is the European Space Agency. Okay, well, so this is the a European answer to NASA. They had launched a satellite in 2009 to do just this, in part to measure these signals from the wispy imprints of inflation on the early universe's cosmic microwave background. And they had claimed originally that they would beat us to it. So it was very much in a race, but they had extra capability with the extra funding, with the extra, you know, they had a thousand people on their team. We, we had 49 and we're, you know, brilliant and we were able to do it. We actually, in the end, did better than they did, much better than they did. But they had one critical missing piece, which was they had sort of an experimental window only that was sensitive to, sensitive only to dust, meaning that we thought the signal that we saw was the cosmic signal plus the dust. And we wanted to get rid of the dust, subtract the dust, and that would leave us with, but you can't go out and put a vacuum cleaner in space. Instead, yeah. all you can do is put a, is, is make another experiment that's sensitive to the dust. And that is basically another type of component of your telescope, which they had, which we didn't. It turns out they were only sensitive to dust, <laughs> pretty much, and we were uh, pretty much only sensitive to the combination of dust plus the CMB, this cosmic microwave background. Uh, so we asked them, we said, uh, please give us, share us with, you know, share your data with us, and they refused. And at the time, I thought that meant that they had this cosmic signal too, and so why share anything with us? It wouldn't benefit them. Uh, it turns out they didn't have the cosmic signal. They really only had the dust signal. And only after we published the paper, had a press conference, had results published on the front page of the New York Times, uh, did we realize that what we had detected was not the cosmic signal alone. At most, it was the cosmic signal plus a healthy amount of dust. And in the end, we essentially retracted that there was any cosmic signal in there whatsoever. And that the signal that we saw was predominantly dominated by the dust. Oh, no. Uh, sorry about that. You know, that's what happens with, with experiments, unfortunately. You know, with my work with machine learning, it's uh, noise. I guess my version of dust is noise, and it can very much uh, mess with your research. And of course, the you know fallout can be painful. I imagine uh, you know the months afterwards was not an easy one for you, and uh, you know, but you've learned from it, and you've clearly gotten uh, stronger, if you will. I, I've got to jump to two things. One, if in 10 or 20 years, we're able to put a telescope on the moon. 
how much will that increase our ability? Yeah, that'll be a tremendous uh, advance for astronomy. If we could get something on the far side of the moon, it wouldn't be exactly like my uh, branch of astronomy. That's not necessarily best done <clears throat> on the far side of the moon. It's better done in space, probably a lot cheaper. But there are experiments searching for uh, an allied signal, similar to what I do. It would take a little, little bit longer to describe, uh, related to what's called the epoch of reionization, which is a preceding epoch to the formation of galaxies. And that needs to be done there because the signals that they look for, Alex, are in the tens of megahertz range. In other words, they're the same as like an FM, you know, a, a radio station or a cell phone or something like that, or garage door openers. And so those get polluted and contaminated. Whereas on the far side of the moon that you can't even see the earth. And so it'd be completely shielded and they'd be able to get power, energy, resources, and it would be quite a stable place. So that's thought to be one of the best places in the world to look for the first formation of the actual structures in the universe that came about a million years after the Big Bang. And also, while I have you, by the way, last spring, some Chinese scientists came out with some research saying that uh, sonic waves could move uh, actual particles. Do you think that's real or do you think that's only theoretical? Uh, I'm not familiar with that, so I probably shouldn't talk. About it. Sure, I'll definitely send it to you afterwards. So very interesting stuff. It was shared... Uh, by an MIT friend of mine. So uh, we'll get to that later. My last question is, you know, uh, aliens life outside of planet earth. Where are you on that? Tell us your feelings. Uh, I have a controversial feeling. I, I feel like aliens don't exist. And I, and I've done the kind of math and prescriptions about that. I gave a talk at what's called the SETI Institute in Northern California about um, you know, some, some answers, some solutions to the Fermi paradox. So Fermi paradox says that there's trillions of planets in the observable universe, um, and with they've, some of them have lived a lot longer than we have. Uh, the Drake equation suggests a certain number of them that should exist. Why haven't we seen them? Where are they? Fermi, Enrico Fermi, Nobel laureate, famously said, you know, where are they? And my answer is that they probably don't exist. Uh, the hurdles required to make life that's different than us. If we, there was life created on Earth and then that somehow spread throughout the solar system, that's called panspermia. That, that is theoretically possible. Um, there is no evidence necessarily that that's happened. But, um, but there's, that there's you know, entire civilizations with technological life that have shielded themselves outside of the ability of us to detect and are somehow lurking around. I feel that probability is quite low. Um, and it's even lower if you try to assign it ab initio, the formation of life, and then the development of technology, just describing, you know, a 0.1% probability for 10 different events, you know, 0.1 to the 10th power, you start to get into a lower number probability wise than the total number of habitable planets in the, in our, in, at least in our galaxy. Forget about other galaxies. We'll never be able to cut into contact with other galaxies. Um, you know, wormholes and things. They're really fun to talk about on, you know, sci-fi movies, but in reality, we have no evidence that they even exist. Occam's razor, we are alone. Uh, so, no, th this was a, a wonderful conversation. And, Thank uh, you. No, uh, you're an absolutely brilliant guy. And I really hope uh, you win your Nobel Prize one day. And uh, Maybe you too. Uh, oh, thank you so much. So, uh, stay Thanks, safe. Alex. Be um, well. Great talking to you. Bye. You too. Great.